All right, so there's a lot of stuff in that first angel's message, right? There's a there lot that's a in there. And now we're going to move on to the second angel, um, which says this in verse 8 of Revelation 14. Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this is an interesting text, isn't it? It is. And it's referencing it's referencing Babylon, which is interesting because... You know, uh, help correct me on that. What was the time period Revelation was written? Was it like around AD 90, if I remember correctly? Ish. Yeah. Ish, ish somewhere yeah. in there. Mm-hmm. So Kingdom of Babylon wasn't wasn't around during that time, right? Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> well, you have this whole this whole idea, right, that John is is writing and there there's kind of a dual purpose in why we see all this imagery that mm-hmm. is clearly referencing Rome mm-hmm. um, because Rome mm-hmm. is this this horrible persecuting ruling mm-hmm. power in the world like Babylon was yeah. in its day yeah. but it was at the time especially Christians are being persecuted and so you can't just come out openly as a Christian and be disparaging Rome yeah. because they're not going to be down with that so there is an aspect of this, not only in the prophetic imagery that helps us interpret the last mm-hmm. things, yeah. but also in how John is trying to encourage and speak to his churches. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, sometimes you kind of miss that part because it, it's all veiled in this imagery that this is at its core a letter that, that John is writing to yeah. the churches that he kind of had pastoral influence that's over. Right. So that's those seven churches at the beginning of the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it kind of serves this dual purpose. So he's speaking about Babylon, and but he's talking about the characteristics that are yeah. similar between Babylon and the current ruling power, Rome, mm-hmm. and the powers that will be ruling at the end time that go. will be yeah. enacting these laws. So it's right. it's it's drawing these three things together so we can get yeah. glimpses of what the end is going to be yeah. by looking at how Babylon and Rome yeah. were interacting in their attitudes towards the people of God. It's interesting that you say that. So we have kind of a symbolism here, and, and I believe it's Revelation 1, where it's you know in reference to the book and in reference to the seven churches there, that it, it talks about the things that are, and are the things that were, the things that are, and the things that are to come. Yes. All right? And so there's some of these narratives that have this, this history, and I think um, Babylon certainly has quite a history, doesn't mm-hmm. it? It is. Um, oh, probably most commonly we think about the book of Daniel and his time. What are some things that we kind of learn about Babylon from that time period? You know, I, I just in my thinking, I think it helps to kind of start back from where, you know, Babylon is the outflow of the Tower of Babel. Yeah. And and so there is, there's a definite couple of things that, that flow through. But I think when you look at the Tower of Babel as like a mm-hmm. starting point, you get to see this idea that, in uh, in Genesis chapter nine, right mm-hmm. after the flood, yeah, God tells Noah and his sons that they are to go and multiply and fill the earth. Yep. The idea mm-hmm. is, is they're supposed to to you know repopulate the earth, spread out, yep. fill the earth, mm-hmm. and then in um, and he promises in this. He says in verse eleven, "I'm going to establish a covenant with you. I'm never going to destroy the earth again. Yeah. This is done, right? So yeah. you can trust me. So you don't have to band together to yeah. try to protect yourselves because I'm making a covenant that I'm that this is never going to happen again. Yeah. So spread out, and and so there's this command from God to yeah. live one way. Yeah. And as we get down through the generations, uh, eight or nine generations, uh, mm-hmm. we see that the people are like. Mm, just in case <laughs> we're going to do it yeah. our way. And so they yeah. start doing the actual opposite of what God had commanded them to do. Mm-hmm. So rather than spreading out, they yeah. start pulling together yeah. and they start congregating together. And, and, and in the, 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 the passage there, it gives us this idea in, in yeah. Genesis eleven four that let's build a city for ourselves and a tower mm-hmm. whose top is in the heaven yep. so that, you know, this, this idea of self-preservation. Yeah. So it's self-preservation in direct contradiction yeah. to the direction that God right. has given in how he has revealed himself. Yeah. So that's kind yeah. of the starting place for the Tower of Babel, right? right? And so so yeah. God then says, all right, well, okay, then we're going to spread you out, right? And this is actually in <laughs> him not destroying the earth because yeah. now he's like, look, you got to spread out. Like yeah. We got to... We yeah. got to get past this, right? So then when you come to Babylon, yeah. you see the same kind of spirit. 
in what's happening in, in Babylon with yeah. how Nebuchadnezzar, especially in the first you know four chapters with Nebuchadnezzar yep. and how God keeps speaking to him and he keeps like holding on to his pride. Yeah. Right. And it, yeah. you know what one thing I, I love about this is that we see that God has always established his kingdom. Yeah. Well the enemy has always tried to establish his mm-hmm. and it's contrary to God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. And so they're the Tower of Babel. Yeah. There with Nebuchadnezzar, you find these men that are trying to establish themselves, not realizing that there's mm-hmm. dark forces behind this driving them as mm-hmm. well. Yep. And we see this same thing in Revelation, mm-hmm. that there is God establishing his kingdom. Mm-hmm. And then we see that the enemy is trying to establish his, right. and he's using it through this thing we call Babylon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, you know, coming back to the, the Tower of Babel, and that, that some of the characteristics that we see throughout all is that idea of, as they separate them, it's called that they, they had this confusion, right? That's mm-hmm. the whole word of, of mm-hmm. Babel is that there's this this mis you know almost misinformation confusion mm-hmm. you know misunderstanding that is part of the principle that we'll see kind of throughout and um, you know as, uh, God doesn't want us to live in confusion mm-hmm. right no in fact you compare and contrast you see the Tower of Babel there's a reversal of it in the day of Pentecost when, you know, there's this communicating to all of these different languages mm. as far as restoring that uh, of coming together and, and, and him wanting to take away that confusion. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So when, when we are actuated corporately mm-hmm. by the spirit of the enemy to go contrary to words God, to the word of God. Yeah. It, it leads us to a place where we get confused on what's happening, right? So then yeah. so then God confuses the language because people were already confused on what was going on, but yeah. then when we come together under the spirit of God, there is a removal of that confusion because yeah. we can all be brought together when we're we're actually being actuated yeah. by the direction of God yeah. and following God's commands. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think we can there's some key words that we're using there, confusion, misinformation. Mm-hmm. These are key words, especially in today's day and age. Oh, yeah. Are there any news outlets we can truly trust? Mm-hmm. Are there any entities mm-hmm. on earth we can actually trust? Mm-hmm. And the answer is probably not. No, no. It's all fake news. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but there is, there is yeah. one we can trust, yeah. and that yeah. is the word. That is yeah. God. That mm-hmm. is uh, him yeah. speaking through his prophets of old, and now he's revealing it to us today, and that's... That's why we're doing what we're doing here today. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, we yeah. see the breakdown of that in society, right? And that yeah. that people will pick the voice that they have decided is the one that's going to tell them the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> and so far as we're listening to men, yeah, there's only one place we can go where we can yeah really have confidence that what yeah. we're hearing is the truth, and that is from God, yeah. because we're always going to have our our perspectives on it. We're yeah. always going to skew the truth, and so you know. There's nothing but confusion yeah. in this world, in that we're we're really all looking out for ourselves. And I think when you look at like Nebuchadnezzar's story, right, you have repeatedly Daniel chapter two. He gets mm-hmm. this dream. He doesn't yeah. understand the dream. Daniel interprets the dream. He praises God. He's like, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, your yeah. God is good. Yeah. So, but then Daniel chapter three. He's like, But <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do it my way, right? Yeah. And so then Jesus shows up with. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, and then he's like, yeah. "God is good," and he sends this letter. And he's like, "There's no God but God, and God is God." And then you mm-hmm. have, you know, chapter um, four where yep. he gets this dream, and Daniel's like, "Look, th- you're going to be humbled," yeah. and he's like, "Okay, I receive that." But then a year later, he's like, "Look what I have built. This is all me." <laughs> and, and so God has been repeatedly <laughs> saying, "Like, yeah. I'm blessing you. I'm, yeah. you know, I have given the world into your care. You have a, yeah. a responsibility to the world because I have entrusted it to you. And it's pride. It's that self-sufficiency mm-hmm. that continues. To, I mean, that's the issue. I mean, that's the issue with his grandson in, in mm-hmm. Daniel chapter it's six true. is this is yep. pride. I mean, even when you think about how it fell, like they're, yeah. they're, they're under siege. It yeah. wasn't like a surprise attack, right? When Babylon right. fell. <laughs> yeah. Like they're surrounded <laughs> yeah. by all yeah. of this army and yeah. they're like, let's have a party, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so that's that's like the fundamental like undergirding flaw of yeah. Babylon is this arrogance, this yeah. this idea that they're untouchable, self-sufficient yeah. in the face of, of what God has said. And that yeah. is the wine of the wrath of fornication. Mm-hmm. 
people are continuing to drink the pride mm-hmm. and, and and it's continuing to swell up yep. in all yep. of us yep. mm-hmm. if we're not careful unless we allow the humility of Christ in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pride is made. So we have that uh, element of confusion, that element of pride, and mm-hmm. you know, as far as that that battle, uh, Babylon would often do that. I mean, I've heard that they would throw food at their enemies because mm-hmm. they had this twenty year food supply. They had mm-hmm. these impenetrable walls. They just they felt like they were untouchable, mm-hmm. and so. You know, the other aspect is obviously like um, in this time period with Daniel, you know, Israel's kind of ripped from their homes and brought over into captivity in Babylon. You know, and a part of that, um, they bring the vessels from the temple in. you know, they start to kind of defame. They start to um, desecrate these, you know, things that belong to God. And, um, you know, as far as Israel, it's almost like, well, they were they were acting like Babylon, so you might as well, <laughs> might as well mm-hmm. join them, right? Well, what was it that caused the Israel to go into captivity? Yeah. Right. So mm. it was Hezekiah, right? Yeah. Hezekiah yeah. is on his bed. Yeah. He's okay. dying. He's like, God, <laughs> please save me. God's like, All right, yeah. I'm gonna save you. And yeah. then some envoys come from Babylon. He's like, Look at all my wealth. I'm super rich. I'm awesome. Yeah. I'm great. And yeah. then the prophet comes back and he's like, uh, yeah. So listen, here's what's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna come get all that gold that you just showed off because you were yeah. trying to look a some a certain way yeah. in the eyes of these foreign dignitaries. Yeah. And it was the pride of Hezekiah that led to the captivity. I mean, yeah. that's that's literally what happened, yeah, right? So, true. so whenever we start kind of feeling like I've got this, like yep. I can take this, and then that leads us into just like all kinds of difficult places where, mm-hmm. you know, w- once we start down this path of trying to sustain ourselves, then th- the if if pride is what's actuating us, then it's like it doesn't. No matter what it takes, I got to stay yeah. on top. Yeah. I got to stay in front of this, and yeah. and we see that through like even in you know, like even the history of the church, you know, and, and mm-hmm. the, the, the dark ages and the reformation and, and the need for the, the church to be kind of reestablished is that people have gotten um, too caught up in, in their own ideas yeah. about what it needs to be to the point where they stop bearing the image of God and start bearing mm-hmm. the image of someone else and they start persecuting and they start, yeah. you know, uh, trying to attack people that don't agree with them yeah. in the same way, like leading into captivity, the same way Babylon came and took captivity, the same way the Christians were being persecuted by Rome. We see that over and over. Yep. Um, it, it, when we allow ourselves to get out of out of sync with God, yeah. we start trying to control others. One of my favorite books, Steps to Christ, and it was saying that you know we often think of the more grosser sins as the the real problems, not that they're not you know <laughs> important to deal with, but like one of the top, if you think about it, is pride. Because when you're dealing with that, you don't recognize your need. You know, just yeah. as when Babylon is taken captive, right? They're like, we're good. We don't have any need of anything. And Self sufficiency. Yeah, of course we we all are at risk of, in a sense. Um, uh, playing a part of that uh, Babylon, you know, perspective in our own lives, and and that's that's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the moment that we feel like we're good, like we're okay, not to say that we we can't be at peace and have that, but the moment that we feel like we don't need God, um, that's that's a dangerous moment. Yeah, I think that's a that's an important distinction to make because I'm okay. Yeah, like. I, I'm sitting solid in my identity in Christ. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Like, I don't question that at all. Yeah. Right. But it's because I root that not in what I'm doing, not yeah. because I'm a pastor, not because I preach, not because yeah. of anything other than yep. that it's been given to me by God. Yeah. And that's, that's what God was trying to, you know, communicate to Nebuchadnezzar mm-hmm. all through, you know, the, the opening chapters of Daniel is like, I have done this for you. Yeah. You know, and Nebuchadnezzar just, that was his journey, you know, until the end. And I, I think he did get it. I think that after his yeah. year living as a beast in the field, like he got it. And I, yeah. and I feel like that, that he was able to walk that out the rest of his life. But, but that was the journey. And that's yeah. what God's really trying to get us to. And that the things that happen, the, the consequences that are allowed to take place in our life when we, are acting out of turn, just yeah. like the fall of Babylon, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not so much that mm-hmm. you, know, you kind of look at prophecy this way, and this is a question that people have is like, you know, is God, if God mm-hmm. is sovereign, then he's doing all these bad things. If Belteshazzar had been paying attention yeah. and not having a party, mm-hmm. he would have seen him 
blocking up the river and <laughs> going down and opening the <laughs> gate under the river. Right. Yeah. If he had listened to Daniel, who had the scroll of Isaiah, who had already said this is exactly how yep. Cyrus like 300 years before Cyrus is even born, mm -hmm. the Bible names him, yeah. and he's got Daniel there to advise him to say, hey, I, yeah. I knew this guy, you know, he wrote this book, and it says that Cyrus, who's sitting outside your gates right now, is going to block up the river, and he's going to come, and he's going to open the gate under the river, mm -hmm. and they're blocking up the river, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if he just listened to, to how God was trying to move, like none yeah. of that would have happened. So it was just a consequence yeah. of his actions, his decision to trust in himself. Yeah rather than listen to what God was trying to, to guide him yeah. into. Yeah. You know, I think that leads us to the opposite of that, which is Paul, who says, I am content with all things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that because I have strength in Jesus Christ, I can do all things. I can mm -hmm. yeah. I can be content yeah. with whether I'm a, a rich or whether I'm poor, whether I'm mm -hmm. abased or whether mm -hmm. whatever I'm lifted up. Yep. It doesn't matter. I can be content because I have God, and I trust in him. Yeah. I believe yep. in him, and I have this relationship with him. So therefore, I can endure it. I'm okay with it yeah. because I'm in Christ. Yeah. That's another one of those yeah. misunderstood Bible verses, right? I can do <laughs> yeah. all things through yeah. Christ who strengthens me. Right. Uh, is not about being an NBA star. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> True story. Yeah, yeah. I've said it. I still can't dunk. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You yeah. know, um, speaking of that that time in Babylon, I think there is such a lesson in there of how God protects his people in times of intensity. We were talking about mm -hmm. that, that earlier. Because here you have Daniel yes. who reads the writing, mm -hmm. you know, and what did they do as they're being taken over? They make him third ruler in the kingdom. <laughs> they put the royal robes on him and yes. all that thing. So mm -hmm. as soon as <laughs> Cyrus and them come in to take over... They recognize his wisdom. He looks like a king of Babylon. Who, who mm -hmm. are you going to take out? Yeah. Right. But yet he's brought into the next kingdom instead of taken mm -hmm. out. And that's such an example of how God protects his people mm -hmm. Through yeah. the craziness, you know, yeah. through the absolute craziness. And I, I think that's a that's a good lesson to learn, especially as we get ready to start talking about the third angel and, yeah. and all of the, the stuff that comes around these concepts of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. And, Absolutely. And the, the, the things that it says there about being tortured and that kind of stuff is that is that God is going to look out for his people the same yeah. way that God ultimately, even though mm -hmm. God's own people's own decision led to their captivity. Yeah. It was, you know, and and even though uh, they were in this, this precarious place under Babylon, under Medo-Persia, even though in the same way that the church endured the persecution of Rome, mm -hmm. when persecutions come, and when I say persecution, I mean real persecutions, not Western yeah. persecutions like we're all worried about right now. I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about like Middle Eastern persecutions where yeah. Christians are yeah. getting killed because they believe in Jesus, yes. not yeah. we have to bake a cake for someone we don't agree with. Yeah. Like... When that comes, yeah. God is going to protect his people, yeah. and he's going to see us through the same way that yep. he has seen his people through Absolutely. under every kingdom that has persecuted him before. Yeah. So, you know, as we're talking about these characteristics of Babylon, we come to Revelation, and we see that there's different symbolism, things uh, things that are, are almost spiritual in nature or symbolic in nature. So we're not talking about literal, you know, Babylon that's taking place, but these characteristics that find themselves into other kingdoms kind of in our time. And another way to support that is, you know, Galatians 3, 26 kind of gives this idea in terms of Israel. It says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and according to that promise, right? So there's this idea of spiritual Israel. There's this idea of spiritual Babylon. And I think another thing that's interesting and, um, you know, within this angel's message is it references, you know, this Babylon that it's fallen, you know, so there's hope in that. Yes. Um, but also I think we often just automatically assume, well, this is a, a secular ruler type of thing. Uh, but not in every case, because it, it mentions because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And biblical prophecy always points to a woman representing a church. And so is that mean, does that mean that there's the idea of Babylon flowing in to elements of Christianity? What do you guys think on that? Well, I think that, you know, in the Old Testament and up into, you know, the death of Jesus and the the resurrection of Jesus, 
you had this idea that God was trying to have his people, and that was based in a very tribal understanding, right? Mm -hmm. So it was Abraham, yeah. and it was Abraham's seed, and mm -hmm. then it was the children of Israel, yeah. and all the way up until that time. And, and the passage you shared in Galatians shows us that, that what is happening now is that, that God's people is not derived by lineage, but mm -hmm. by faith. Yeah, and it so it, it yeah. does. It breaks apart this idea that if if God's God's pure woman is mm -hmm. His spiritual Israel, it's those who put their faith in Him. Yeah. Then the concepts that we're talking about here is not so much that it's a literal kingdom, mm -hmm. but that it is a conglomeration of the forces that would work against the the truth of God's word. Yeah. At the end, so it's yeah. not so much that we need to focus in on a specific entity mm -hmm. as much as we need to understand that. In the same way that God has welcomed in all who would come to Him, all yeah. those who would not come to Him will be drawn by the enemy to align, even if it's not so much under one structure, but in mm -hmm. principle, in ideas, mm -hmm. in in just yeah. nature and culture, to be counter to God. You know, yeah. a couple of chapters over in Revelation 18, yeah, he talks about Babylon has fallen, has fallen again, and he mm -hmm. says in verse four, and I heard a voice from heaven crying. Come out of her, my people, mm. lest you share in her sins, unless you receive her plagues. Yeah. And so we see this element of Babylon trying to creep inside of the church. Yeah. Uh, when Christ came, uh, yeah. we see the Pharisees, and yeah. they're the ones that actually plotted to kill him. Yeah. And it, it happened, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. he still died for them. Yeah. Uh, there were some of the Pharisees that were won over. We see specifically Nicodemus, mm -hmm. right? And so for us to now say, well, I belong, insert whatever denomination it is that's there. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the enemy is not trying to attack and trying to infiltrate. Yeah. What it does mean is that we can choose which side we're on mm -hmm. by choosing to listen to the voice of God yeah. and the and his true voice and not the yeah. dissenting voices that the enemy is trying to hurl at us. Yeah. That's so critical. I would, just just for the sake of, of semantics, I think that you know we were talking about in the last episode this idea of dualities, right? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Can a pure woman be partially a harlot? So when it when the call is to come out of mm -hmm. her, my people, mm -hmm. it's not so much that the that the pure woman has been infiltrated. Mm -hmm. It's that there's a clear distinction between yes. it. Yeah, and so yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's important because yeah. again, we're anchoring back to yeah. to God and God's word, right. and we're we're not we're we're skewing the idea of traditions, yeah. right? And and even in this idea of denominations and and mm -hmm. organizations that exist in the way the church has formed itself yeah. in the world today. Those are not clear delineating factors that mm -hmm. determine whether or not we're yeah. a pure woman or a harlot. Right. And so, you know, we got to get that clear that, that yeah. those are not the things that determine which one we are. Yeah. Right. Because we can only be one. Right. We can't be sort of a harlot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's true. You know, I, I tell people all the time never take my word for it, right? Mm -hmm. Always test everything from scripture. Mm -hmm. And I've heard so many people say, oh, well, this is what I believe because. You know, my pastor said it, or this person, or this is what I grew up with, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what we're getting at, is we need to be spending time in the Bible itself, mm -hmm. you know, with it, because we're all human, we're all fallible, mm -hmm. right? And clearly, <laughs> humanity has messed up a few times, right? right. And so... Um, back to the idea that we, thankfully, we have something that we can genuinely trust. And if we have something that we can genuinely trust, then I... I I hope that we would spend more time with that than with all the other outlets of things that we can't necessarily yeah. trust as much. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think it ties on to Wes's point as well, which is God has always had a remnant, mm -hmm. yeah. a people that have always been true to him, and yeah. that is his church. Yeah. That's right. These people that follow the lamb wherever he goes, these people that stick with him, yeah. and yeah. they will always be there, and we can choose to be a part of that, and that will never be corrupted. Yeah. yeah. 